from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Here. Um, my name is Marty Barron. I'm the executive editor of the Washington Post. Uh, I'm delighted that you're all, you're all here. Uh, wow, some applause. I us I'm usually... I'm accustomed to booing, but um, in any event. Uh, I want to say that the Washington Post has been a proud charter sponsor of the National Book Festival for 13 years, and I want to thank the Library of Congress for putting on the, uh, this great event. I'm also obligated to mention to you that, um, that these presentations are being filmed, uh, so um, I want you to know that, that when you do come up to the mic that you, you will be filmed, and it's important that you uh, that you do come up to the mic when you want to ask uh, when you want to ask questions. So uh, to get to our uh, our author and our speaker, uh, David Finkel. Now, how many times have uh, have we said or have you heard someone say to a member of the military, just simply thank you for your service? It's an easy thing to say, uh, but do we understand it? Do we really know about that service? I am proud to be a colleague at the Washington Post of someone who was determined to find out and to tell us, and to tell us with absolute honesty. David Finkel has written an important book, a necessary sequel to The Good Soldiers, his chronicle of the soldiers of the 216. That's the 2nd Battalion, 16th Infantry Re Regiment of the 4th Infantry Brigade Combat Team, 1st Infantry Division. The good so in The Good Soldiers, the reviewer of the New York Times wrote, David gave, quote, unforgettable voice to the men who fought and lived and to those who did not and whose voices we otherwise might not have heard. Those who lived came home, and that is the subject of David's just published book, Thank You for Your Service. Their physical injuries, their non-physical wounds, the war that follows them unsparingly when they deserve to be at peace. Now, David is a Pulitzer Prize winner. He is a MacArthur Fellow. He now serves as editor to some of the finest writers at the Washington Post, and he is re revered as one of the best journalists in America. But above all, he is an individual consumed by a sense of duty to the generous people who allow him into their lives, to readers who are owed the plain truth. I am pleased to introduce David Finkel. Hi. Hi. Um, first, thanks for coming. And I'd like to start off by telling you uh, about something that isn't in the book. Uh, it's about the moment that I decided I had done enough reporting and researching and I was ready to start writing. If you read this book, uh, you're going to meet a guy named Adam Schumann, an Iraqi veteran who at one point had to go to a uh, mental health treatment center in Northern California. And when he was done, um, and he drove back home to Kansas with his wife, Saskia, I was in the back seat for the drive. And uh, Adam's plan was to leave at sundown, to drive through the night without stopping, uh, except for gasoline and some bottles of water now and then. And that's what they did. Uh, off they went. And, Look, somewhere around 2 in the morning, I guess, in the middle of Utah, it was dark, I got drowsy, uh, I fell asleep in the back seat. And to give you a sense of what a nice man Adam Schumann is, um, he had to go to the bathroom. He had to pee. And he was so concerned that he might wake me up if he pulled over that he did the old Iraq soldier trick that as he drove, he peed into a water bottle. The way I found out about this, unfortunately, was maybe an hour later, I'm not quite sure how long, but I woke up and I was in the back seat and it was dark and it was quiet and I was thirsty. <laughs> so I reached around in the dark for my water bottle and I unscrewed the cap and I took a big gulp. And at some point I thought, I think I'm done with my reporting. So, well, that's a charming story. <laughs> that story is not in the book. What is in the book are stories of what I refer to as the afterwar, 
of what is going on all around us now that the Iraq war is over, the Afghanistan war is about over, and those wars have come, come home and are coming home to here. The book is about war soldiers, wives of war soldiers, children of war soldiers, widows of war soldiers. It's an emotional book, and it's a book that I hope lives up to what the great author Ben Fountain said of it in a quote for the cover. This is a book that will piss you off and break your heart. I first met Adam Schumann in 2007 when I was working on my first book, uh, The Good Soldiers, and I embedded with an Army Infantry Battalion that spent 15 months in a pretty lousy neighborhood in East Baghdad as part of uh, the operation known as The Surge. And you know, these guys had a pretty rough time of it. Uh, one day over there, I was asking around for just another soldier to talk to, a great soldier, and somebody mentioned this guy, Adam Schumann. So a few days later, I went and I found him in his room, and he was sitting in shorts and a t-shirt, and he looked up, and I introduced myself, and he said, I guess I know why you're here. I said, well, I'm here because I heard you're a pretty great soldier. He said, well, maybe I was, but I'm, I'm about to go home. So what had happened is after three tours in Iraq and a thousand days in combat, this widely acknowledged great soldier had broken and he was headed home that day and he was ashamed. And I stayed with him and I remember walking through the base we were on uh, so he could get the helicopter out. And there, I don't know, there's a, a small line of maybe six guys in line. He takes his position at the back of the line. A couple of helicopters come in and land Everybody moves forward, you know, huge dust and clatter and the rest of it. He moves forward, and as he gets to the front of the line, the guy stops him. And then he yells, the next one's yours. The helicopters leave. Now it's just Adam Schumann by himself wondering what's going on. Another set of helicopters land. Uh, these helicopters have big red crosses on the side, and that's when it hit him. These were the helicopters for the injured and the dead, and that's who he had become. He was injured, he was dead, and he was done. And he went home. So I stayed in touch with Adam, and, uh, and the way thank you for your service begins is with Adam, and it's two years later, and, and this is how the book starts, if you'll indulge me. Two years later, Adam drops the baby. The baby who is four days old is his son. And there is a moment as he is falling that this house he has come to seems like the most beautiful and peaceful place in the world. Outside is the cold dead of 3 a.m. on a late November night in Kansas. But inside is lamplight, the warm smell of a newborn, and Adam's wife Saskia, beautiful Saskia, who a few minutes before had asked her husband if he could watch the baby so she could get a little sleep. I got it, he'd said. She curled up in the middle of their bed, and the last thing she glimpsed was Adam reclined along the edge, his back against the headboard, and the baby in his arms. He was smiling, as if contentment for this wounded man were possible at last, and she believed it enough to shut her eyes just before he shut his. His arms soon relaxed. His grip loosened. The baby rolled off of his chest and over the edge of the bed, and here came that peaceful moment, the baby in the air, Adam and Saskia asleep, everyone oblivious, the floor still a few inches away, and now with a crack followed by a thud, the moment is over and everything that will happen is underway. Saskia is the one who hears it. It's not loud, but it is loud enough. Her eyes fly open. She sees Adam, closed-eyed, emptied armed, and only when he hears screaming and feels the sharp elbows of someone scrambling across him does he wake up from the sleep he had promised he didn't need. It takes him a second or two, then he knows what he has done. He says nothing. There's nothing he can say. He is sorry. He is always sorry now. He has been sorry for two years since he slunk home from the war. He watches his wife scoop up the baby. He keeps watching, wishing she would look at him willing her to, always so in need of forgiveness, but she won't. She clutches the crying baby as he dresses and leaves the room. 
He sits for a while in the dark, listening to her soothe the baby, and then he goes outside, gets into his pickup truck, and positions the shotgun so that it is propped up and pointed at his face. In that way, he starts driving, while back in the house, Saskia is trying to understand what happened. A crack, a thud. The thud was the floor, and thank God for the ugly carpet. But what was the crack? The bed frame, the nightstand? This baby, so resilient. Maybe he's one of the lucky ones, born to be okay. Not even a mark, somehow fine. Saskia lies with him, then gets up and comes back with a plastic bottle of water. She drops it from the side of the bed and listens to the sound it makes as it hits the floor. She drops a pair of heavy shoes and watches them bounce. She finds a basketball and rolls it off the edge. She fills a drink container with enough water to weigh about as much as the baby, and as Adam continues driving and considering the gun, not yet, not yet, not yet, not yet, she rolls that off the edge too. And the book goes on from there. Um, as I said, the story of the afterwar. Since 9-11, uh, uh, two and a half million Amer Americans have joined the service and been deployed. Of the two and a half million, two million have been deployed into Iraq and Afghanistan. And of the two million, the estimates are that 20 to 30 percent have come home with some kind of psychological wound, primarily PTSD, also TBI, traumatic brain injury, which is what the cycle excuse me, the psychological damage that occurs when a brain is, is rattled violently by an explosion. It's worth emphasizing that of the two million, 1.5 million are just fine. They've moved on. In some cases, they're better for the experience. But this book isn't about them. They can have another book. My interest is the 500,000 and the many, many more that are their families. As I write in the book, how to grasp the true size of such a number and all of its implications, especially in a country that has paid such scant attention to the wars in the first place. One way would be to imagine the 500,000 in total, perhaps as points on a map of America, all suddenly illuminated at once. The sight would be of a country glowing from coast to coast. Another way would be to imagine them one at a time starting with the one who is out in the middle of a Kansas night, driving around and around unseen. Toward dawn, he returns home. He doesn't mention to Saskia where he's been or what he had been thinking, and she doesn't ask. Instead, the shotgun is put away, the baby awakens for his next feeding, and a breaking family whose center has become Adam's war wounds try to get on with another day to recover, followed by another day after that. You know, look, in, 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 in so many ways, in, in the year and a half I spent researching this book, it's the trying, that aspect, not so much the circumstances, but, but against those circumstances, the trying to heal, the trying to recover, that was the most moving thing of all. After, after 18 months of my reporting, I think I'm comfortable saying that these are all pretty amazing people. They are wounded, they're flawed, they're angry, they're funny at times, they're pretty wonderful most of the time. The book I've written about them is, is a piece of journalism, observed journalism. And even though it's journalism, look, there are no headlines here. We get it, we know that war is lousy, and we know that recovery is hard. And there are lots of books out there on PTSD at the moment, full of possible causes, trying to tease that apart, statistics, this book isn't that book or any of those books. It's a ground level, intimate view that offers stories of what coming home is like. And what I'd like to do before we get to questions is just spend a few minutes more telling you some of the other characters in the book and briefly some of their stories. For instance, there's a guy named Michael Emery. Michael Emery at the beginning, about two months into the deployment, was on a roof during an operation when a sniper got a clean shot into his head and he went down on a rooftop, gravely wounded. And it just so happened that the way he got off the rooftop is Adam Schumann put him on his back 
in a fireman's carry and took him down three flights of stairs. And it just so happened because of the angle of things, a lot of the blood coming out of Michael Emery's head kept going into Adam Schumann's mouth. To this day, Adam Schumann can still taste that blood. As for Emery, the life afterward for him, he was supposed to die and didn't, was supposed to not walk and does, was supposed to not talk and does that too. He's a walking miracle, his chief doctor says, and then revises that. He's an absolute walking phenomenon to those who don't know differently. He was shot in the head and the bullet ruined the part of his brain that regulates such things as emotions and impulse control. He has no sensation on his left side. He can't move his left foot or toes. He can't straighten his left arm. He can't wink his left eye. He's divorced now from Maria, the woman he was married to when he was in the hospital and who didn't leave his bedside. I love you, baby, she would say over and over to him in those first days when he couldn't talk and could barely move. Her and her damn mouth is what he says about what happened after that. He has a young daughter who was in the family truck one day when he all of a sudden went haywire, punched the rearview mirror, shattered the windshield, now the daughter has gone to Texas with her mother and he is grateful so she doesn't have to grow up around such a man as himself. Before he was shot, he was never angry. Now he can't control it. Now he telephones his daughter every day from a safe distance. My little giraffe, he calls her. He has an aide who helps him with his leg braces, who double knots his shoes, and who sometimes takes him into town for lunch. And whenever she does that, he asks her to dress him in a t-shirt that says, what have you done for your country on the front? And I took a bullet in the head for mine on the back. So people who stare at him won't think they're looking at the results of some drunk in a car wreck. He has a computer he uses to introduce himself to women on dating sites. He is always honest, saying he got injured in the war. And in six months, there's been one response from someone who wrote back, thank you for serving our country. He still has the helmet he was wearing when he, is sh when he was shot, which has the hole where the bullet went in and the hole where the bullet went out and which he uses every Halloween as a candy bowl. He was suicidal for a while, but isn't so much anymore. One time when he wasn't yet walking, he tried to tip over his wheelchair, hoping he would bang his head hard enough on the floor to die. One time when Maria was still taking care of him, he asked her to bring a pencil so he could stab himself in the neck. One time. His last attempt, he tried to bite through his wrists. He's not as angry anymore either, he says, although sometimes he is. And he's not as depressed anymore, although sometimes he is that too. Mostly, he is alone, just alone. And sometimes he thinks about how he joined the army to become a mechanic, and if he hadn't switched jobs, none of this would have happened, so it's no one's fault but his own. Everybody tells me it's not my fault. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. Yes, it is, he says. There is a, uh, there's a widow named Amanda Doster, who for a time drove everywhere with the box containing her husband's cremated remains buckled next to her in the passenger seat of her car with the seatbelt, and a soldier named Nick Nanino, who went to the war with a tattoo that said unity and peace, and then he punched his first Iraqi in the face, and then he pushed his first Iraqi down some stairs, and then he was home crying and telling his wife, I feel like a monster. There's a guy, there's a guy named Tesolo Ayeti, who was in a Humvee that was blown sky high, and a couple of years later had a breakdown. He spent seven weeks in the PTSD program, where he was called a hero again and again, and asked to write about what he had done in the war, so he might believe it. So he wrote about what he did. 53 pages about what happened after the boom, the Humvee rising in the air, the concussion of the bomb, opening the door, trying to run, collapsing with a broken leg, limping back to the Humvee and pulling out a bloody soldier, pulling out a second one who was moaning and even bloodier as the Humvee sparked and burst into flames, collapsing again, relieved that everyone was out, and then hearing someone yelling Harrelson's name, and it hit me, oh shit, Harrelson. I forgot all about him. That's what he had written. I looked over and all I could see was flames and the outline of a body where he was in the driver's seat. Over and over he had written about it all, except for the one thing he has told no one, a dream he's been having ever since, Harrelson on fire, asking him 
Why didn't he save me? There's a guy named Tim Jung. And Tim Jung is one of the uh, people in charge of new arrivals at something called the Warrior Transition Battalion, where injured soldiers like Schumann, like Nick Danino, like Ayeti, go to recover. Tim Jung, the wide-eyed, the nervous-eyed, the closed-eyed, the dead-eyed, they all start out with Tim Jung, a friendly, gum-chewing, boyish-looking sergeant first class who one day, without telling anyone, goes for a drive by himself into the Kansas countryside. Fifteen miles from the WTB, he pulls into a dirt parking lot next to the Big Blue River. It's late afternoon, and not many people are around, but just to be sure he won't be interrupted, he decides to go to the far side of the river. He climbs an embankment and starts across a long train trestle. If a train comes, there won't be much he can do, but at this point, it hardly matters. He has plenty of sleeping pills with him and blank paper on which to write letters to his children. His plan is simple. Write the letters, swallow the pills, wade into the water, and let the river take it from there. It's hard to say what has brought him to this point. Probably, like so many cases he's seen at the WTB, it's not one thing in particular, but an accumulation of everything. On the far side now, no train, he'll have to do it himself. He walks south along the river's edge until he finds a place to sit. The air has that damp, moldy smell of mud and ripe leaves, but he doesn't mind it. He takes out the paper and a pen and wonders in his life's last moments what to write about all that has happened. A life of soldiering, a long marriage that failed, a period of cancer treatments. Any one of them could be its own letter, but what he chooses instead for his final words are the thoughts of a father who is proud of his children and knows absolutely that they will go on to accomplish great things. He writes for a while in the stink of the river until he is sure he has written something okay for his children to reread for the rest of their life in a lifetime of trying to drown out the noise of what he's about to do. And then he gets the pills ready and takes a look around the spot he has chosen. He is looking west into a setting sun that seems to be lighting the river on fire. It is beautiful, he allows himself to think. And as he keeps looking, he takes notice of the river's current, which strikes him as beautiful too. He watches some water bugs skimming along the surface and some birds rotting along the late afternoon drafts. There are crickets also pining away in the grasses and weeds, and whereas a few minutes before he was hearing and seeing none of this, now he sits with pills in hand and letters next to him transfixed. The crickets keep singing. The water keeps moving. The sun keeps dropping. It's beautiful, he keeps thinking. And in that little bit of hesitation, something inside of him turns or recedes or cracks open or does whatever happens when someone no longer wants to die. Because when at last he stands up, it is to go gratefully away from the river, back across the trestle, back home to hide the letters in the desk drawer, and back to the WTB, where the new arrivals keep coming and coming and coming, all of them headed to the river. So who are these people who are headed to the river? Well, if you'll permit me, one last excerpt. They are the ones home from the war, where every day would begin the same way. The soldiers would tuck lucky charms into their pockets, and joke about their final words. They would gather in quick circles to pray and smoke the last cigarette of their lives. They would tighten their body armor, push in their earplugs, lower their shatter-resistant sunglasses, and tug on their burn-resistant gloves. And when someone called out, let's go, they would climb into their Humvees and go, knowing full well what was waiting for them down the road. They had seen Harrelson's Humvee rise into the air and burst into fire. They had seen Emery get shot in the head and collapse in his own spreading blood. They had seen soldiers lose legs, lose arms, lose feet, lose hands, lose fingers, lose toes, and lose eyes. And they had heard them, too, in the aid station, in whatever pain is enough pain to make a 19-year-old scream. They had heard a soldier ask, is anything sticking out of my head after a mortar attack? They had heard a doctor say, I'm hoping, I'm hoping, about a soldier who in a few minutes would be dead. They heard a soldier tell a dying soldier as he stuffed what was left of it into a Humvee, you're gonna have to move your feet so I can close the door. 
they had heard a soldier who had lost his right leg and left leg and right arm and most of his left arm saying, it hurts. They had heard a sergeant who was watching something skid across the floor of the aid station, which had fallen from a shredded soldier who was about to die, say with sadness, that's a toe. Most of all, they had heard explosion after explosion and seen dozens of Humvees disappear into breathtaking clouds of fire and debris. And by the end, most of them had been inside such a cloud themselves, blindly feeling around in those initial moments to determine if they were alive or dead or intact or in pieces as their ears rang and their hearts galloped and their souls darkened and their eyes occasionally filled with tears. So they knew, they knew. And yet day after day, they would go out anyway, which eventually came to be what the war was about. Not winning, not losing, nothing so grand, just trying and then trying again until it was time to go home and discovering that life after the war would be very much the same. You may think I've read the whole book by now, and I promise you uh, there's a lot more in there. Um, the title, uh, by the way, isn't meant to be ironic or bitter. Uh, its meaning is simpler, that when you say thank you for your service, these are some of the people you're thanking, and this is what you're thanking them for. The, there's one last story. This is, this is what happened after I drank Adam Schumann's urine. And, uh, and the trip went on and neared its end. Saskia is driving. They fight in eastern Colorado. They make up. They fight again in western Kansas. They make up again. A car won't get out of the way. She gets close. It won't move. She gets closer. It still won't move. She honks her horn. It still won't move. She is so close she can read the bumper sticker. Pray for our troops, it says. Now the car moves over and Saskia guns it. They're almost home. So thank you and for listening to that and I hope we'll have some questions. Oh, there's that. Okay. Hi. I'm sorry. Go ahead. You're at the microphone. Go so go ahead. Um, thank you so much for talking. Um, I wanted to ask you how yeah. you deal personally with being so close to tragedy. If you feel like that affects you, or how do you deal with other people's problems? Yeah. Like I, I mean, I mean, clearly, uh, 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 I've been working on this story for for six years, and uh, and I, you know. 15 months uh, uh, embedded with these troops in a, in a bad war zone and then uh, writing that book and a year and a half of living with them and watching them try to recover and then writing that story. So it's, it's, it's impossible not to feel something. Uh, the important thing as a writer is to, I think, make sure that the emotions I'm writing about uh, represent their emotions rather than mine, if that makes sense. And uh, so I guess that's why these things took so long. But look, it's 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 writing is a cathartic thing, and and the uh, the soldiers, the ex-soldiers now for the most part, uh, they haven't had that luxury. You know, they they didn't get to come home from this experience, and then take this this mess of notes that was chronological and try to give a narrative frame to it. Uh, they, they, and for nine months I got to do that and then I got to do it again after this one. They just moved on to the next thing and uh, obviously in some cases continue to have difficulties. But it's a good question, thank you. Hi. Hey, hi David. Hi Eva. Um, I'd like to thank you very much for writing this book but and also the first one, The Good Soldiers. Okay. And as you know, I made sure that my students at the Virginia Military Institute read it, as well as many other cadets. And you gave them much to think about. You gave them many moments to pause and to think. 
And thank you for that. Well, thank you, Hiva. My question to you is, since you've been working on this since 2007, for several years now, um, have you seen any improvements in um, the services and support that we as a nation, as a society, and armed forces um, provide these soldiers? Well, I wish I could answer it. It's a great question, and I wish I could answer it with some authority. Uh, I can only answer it anecdotally based on what I saw in front of me. Um, sure, there's more attention than there used to be to the subject, but uh, but it's, it's, it's kind of a mess. Uh, the system, and, and when I say the system, I mean, I mean the military, the VA. I mean, these folks would be the first to acknowledge that as hard as they're trying, they're pretty, they're pretty overwhelmed trying to keep up. Uh, is it better? Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, guys can get help now. But look, it's such a, it's such a crapshoot. There, so I mentioned three guys, Schumann, Danino, and Ayeti. Okay, and, and, and all have difficulties. All need to go into some type of mental health program. So Ayeti goes into a seven-week program that is run by the VA. Um, then it's Nick Danino's turn, and he'd very much like to go into the VA program, but he needs help quickly, and there's a long waiting list, and so they find room for him in another program. That one's four weeks long. Is one better? Is one worse? Well, he went to the four-week one because the four-week one had an opening. It, not it was a fine program, but it wasn't necessarily suited to his particular problems. And then it's Adam Schumann's turn. And this guy finally reaches the point where he will acknowledge, yes, I need some help. I want to go into a program. The seven-week one is full. The four-week one is full. This is his moment where he's finally acknowledging, I need some help. And believe me, with these guys, the moment passes, and you got to grab it. So his caseworker looked around and around, and finally she found a program in Northern California that is not VA affiliated, that is not insurance driven, it's donor supported entirely. He got to go to a program where the minimum you stay is four months, which gives you ample time to really tease some things apart. So. You know, is one better than the other? They're all fine in their own ways, but they're all able to do different things. And where a soldier ends up is largely based on where there's an opening. And I hope that helps. Hi. Hi. Um, you uh, mentioned just now uh, some problems where uh, people are uh, encountering overwhelmed programs where they are uh, not getting uh, sufficient treatment um, we obviously have sequestration and we have the continuing resolution. Uh, is there uh, any uh, uh, anecdotal evidence or, or stories that uh, you have been told uh, by the wounded, uh, the mentally wounded, uh, where they say um, uh, that they were unable to get something because it just wasn't there? Did you ever speak with, uh, let's say, a psychiatrist who said things are being cut back because of the budget considerations? Oh, yeah, yeah, I see what you're asking. You know, my reporting ended before sequestration started, so I can't tell you about that. I can tell you, uh, and th this won't answer your question, but I'll tell it anyway. Uh, I was talking to uh, a woman the other day, just terrific, and uh, she's so cool. Uh, lost. Uh, an arm at the beginning, near the beginning of the Iraq war and had finally reached the point where she was getting pretty anxious and she wanted to get some help. Uh, she lives in this area. And you know, this is, this is good around here. There, there are psychologists, there are social workers, there are psychiatrists. They like working in Washington, D.C. There are plenty of them. It's not like some of the places in the interior where so many soldiers come from where if you need help, one of the reasons for the delay is there just aren't enough people to offer help. Um, here there are plenty. When she called the VA to make an appointment, they said, well, we can see you in 60 days. And uh, so she waited. And then she went into the VA. And uh, you know, she was kind of sitting there in the waiting room. And it was a bad day at the VA. And she was surrounded by some pretty hardcore Vietnam cases of guys. I mean, you know the guys. Just uh, uh, they fought hard. And they're, they're a little mumbly now. And, and 
and not in the best shape. And she looked around and she said, is this the club I'm in now? And kind of went home and took care of it herself. They're, they're, it's so complicated. So many things can go wrong for someone to get help. There's the stigma. I mean, these infantry guys especially, these are tough guys. They don't want to acknowledge they need help. They, or if they do get help, they might do it off post. So their chain of command won't find out. And I can't tell you how many meetings I sat in at the Pentagon where there was a suicide. They were discussing what happened, and only after the fact did they find out that the guy had been seeking help because they didn't know because of HIPAA rules, things like that. So it's almost like when things work out, it's a surprise because they're just from, from behavior to stigma to attitudes to, to, to availability of help. There are a lot of things that can go wrong as these guys try to recover. That's, that's, that's the best answer I got. Thank you. Hi. Hi, thank you for your work. Um, I'm the mother of a Marine who has served three tours in Afghanistan. Both of his children were born uh, on those tours. And one of the things that um, I wish would be addressed um, is what this does to parents. There is a lot of um, talk about the soldier or the Marine, the children, the spouse, but I wish people understood the impact on the parents and what parents need to know to be able to deal with their soldier or Marine when that person returns. Yeah, well, well, good for you for bringing this up. There was a, uh, there was a, a, a reaction I got after the first book, um, uh, after the, uh, the Good Soldiers was published, where I began getting, uh, you know, by now hundreds of emails from soldiers uh, saying, I was in the war, I came home, uh, everyone wants to know what it was like. Uh, I don't want to talk about it, and I can't talk about it, but I read your book, and I give people your book and say, read the book, and you'll know what it was like and why I can't talk about it. That was a nice reaction to get. Um, and I'm hoping that this book, uh, the stories of these folks, and look, these folks stand in for so many of the other 500,000. It's, 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 they're not a unique group. They're a representative cluster of what's going on in, in, in communities across the country. So, so the hope is that the book gets out and is read a little bit and this, the, the stories of these people come to solidify on our understanding of what parents are going through, families, the rest of it. Yes. Uh, thank you for your book. Um, my wife is a teacher in a situation uh, where she's always been teaching military kids uh -huh. since 2000. Yeah. And I think that the story that hasn't been told yet and, and needs to be is, is what the impact is for these children. Um, the, the, the multiple deployments, the parents who are going to be home are not the, the stress that they're under. Uh, certainly there are a lot of care uh, facilities that the military provides. They're doing a great job of that. Mm -hmm. But still, you know, those children are not being cared for. Right. And I would hope that perhaps in your next book you'd think about looking at the plight of of those children and those families that are the result of this, not the, the, just the 30% that we know served yeah. and, and have the visible wounds uh, and, and the obvious wounds of being in the conflict, but well, those families. That's great. Thanks for the comment also uh, for teaching. I appreciate that a lot. That's nice to know. Hi. Hi. Um, we actually read all the, good all the Good Soldiers in my Masters of Journalism class, and one of the things that we were particularly looking at the text for was the level of intimacy that you developed with the subjects and the amount of things that they were willing to divulge to you. Um, and as you said, there is sort of a stigma with a lot of, um, a lot of admitting to, to the problems that they're having and the things that are going on. So my question is related to that, and how much of the six years that you spent writing the book or writing All the Good Soldiers was sort of geared towards just building up a rapport where they felt comfortable divulging some of the most traumatic experiences of their lives? Um, I think having the first book out, out uh, established some credibility. I can tell you during the first book, yeah, <laughs> yeah, there, there were some hurdles. Uh, uh, I wasn't just, uh, even though the, the battalion commander had said, come on over, spend the deployment with us, it's not like 800 guys uh, wanted me there or even knew what a journalist was. And, uh, there were plenty of rumors about me. I w I'd been hired by the battalion commander to write his biography. Just, and you can't prove it wrong. So, so how do you, for the kind of work I do, immersion journalism, where you just stay and stay and stay, how do you gain credibility? Well, I think one comes from the act of staying with the story rather than visiting it. Uh, the more I stayed, 
the more people began to get a sense of what I was doing. When bad things happened, and I was present for the bad things, and the smoke cleared, and there's this guy at the edge of things taking notes rather than acting in a way that caused soldiers not to do their job but have to pay attention to me, the fact that they saw me taking notes, that established credibility. But, you know, it was, it, you know, it, it, it took time. It takes time. But I think in this case, the, what allowed the second book, the level of intimacy in the second book, and it is a more intimate reading experience than the first one, is the fact that these are people I knew from Baghdad. Uh, I knew Schumann. I walked with them to the helicopter. I knew Ayeti. I was with him the day he got blown up and stayed with him in the, uh, in the aid station and was with him when he was told that Harrelson was dead. Uh, I knew Nick Danino over there. Uh, I, was, I was just down the street with, when Emery was shot in the head. So, so you know, you just, you just keep playing it forward, right? I, the credibility came from the first book, and this time uh, it wasn't a problem. These, who knows what's going to happen? These people, uh, bless them, think that by opening their lives up and, and, and letting people read about, I mean, these are they're funny moments, but there's some horrible moments in this book. These are true. This is what happened. Their names are in the book. What happened is in the book. So I think their hope is that by, you know, opening it up, uh, people will learn a thing or two. I don't know if it'll happen, but that's their hope. And the least I can do is talk about what they've done and, and try to get their experiences out there. Anyway, the credibility comes from the first book, and I hope the second one doesn't destroy it. Thank you. Okay. Hi. Hi. Um, I actually heard you speak at a American University a couple of years ago, and we've been talking about the good soldiers again in the writing class that I'm TAing this year for Professor Stina Oaks, who I'm sure yeah. you've been in communication with. Yep. So we've been talking about how the writing process was for you the first time around, where she said that you wrote it, you took extensive notes during your during the deployment, and then wrote it in a very short amount of time when you came back. And right. I was just wondering if the process was similar this year or this time around, or if yeah, it was a it's kind of that. a kind of an inside baseball discussion. But uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, I have one move: I go somewhere and hang out. Then I come home with a stack of notes, and I spend a year writing those notes into a, a story or or a book. So it was the same method. It's at this. I'm getting too old to change. It's it's what I got. So. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm looking forward to reading your book after okay. hearing your talk. And the, the question that came to mind is what can the people in this tent do to help the folks and folks like the ones that you wrote about? Well, you're in the tent. That's a pretty good start, you know. Uh, I appreciate that. You seem, you seem to be willing to hear some specifics about what's going on, and, uh, and if I were those soldiers, I'm not, but if I were those soldiers, that act alone uh, would mean quite a bit to me. And where you take it from there, it's, it's just up to each person, right? It's, uh, uh, I know from the first book, uh, plenty of people have started uh, volunteering at uh, Walter Reed, say, or various other places. Um, I don't know, it just depends on, on on what you can handle and, 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 and how willing you are. But, but I'm not kidding. Just paying particular attention rather than assuming you know something, it's huge. It's huge. And, and that's, that's not a small starting point. That's a great starting point. Thank you. OK. Yes? Yes, I was wondering if, uh, well, first I'll explain why I'm asking. I have some friends who were in Iraq and came back. They saw some bad things, we'll put it like that. They opened up a little bit to me, but of course not all yeah. the way. Uh -huh. But what I found um, incredibly frustrating because I couldn't understand it was their desire to go back to Iraq. Did you find the same thing with some of the people that you Yeah, to? yeah, there was a guy in the first unit. Um, uh, I remember I knew him over there, and then I spent some time with him in San Antonio because he lost part of his foot. Oh, man, he wanted so much to go back, and he did. You know, he trained and trained and trained and got himself in shape, and uh, he went to Afghanistan. Uh, not infantry, but, uh, but out on the street. Uh, 
suicide bomber walked up to him and blew him up and he died. Now that's kind of an extreme case, but, but I think about that guy all the time. He just, he wanted so much to go back. Yeah. And it's, 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 it's uh, look, in some cases, there, there were guys over there who would, after a horrible day, would just re-up for, for another tour over there because they're from a place in Ohio with a crappy economy. They had no job prospects. And if they signed up that day, at that moment, they would get $20,000. And by the way, it's tax-free. So they did. I, there were guys who were ruined by that deployment. And there were guys who were ruined before that deployment. And, and they came home great, great human beings. Again, there are just so many versions. But why someone goes back, it depends on the particular person. I think we have time for one last question. Um, this is a, kind of similar to the other question you got about how to help, but you know, the na we've been through wars before. We've had veterans right. come home before. They've been injured. Is there something about that these men and women are experiencing that we're not taking care of when we get home, or there are just more of them, or is it a uniquely different experience? You well. talked about the Vietnam veteran. She, she doesn't want to think she's like them, but. Is she actually worse than them, and are we ready for that? Well, she's different. She's changed. She seems to be doing pretty good. And again, again, like I said in the beginning, most people come home from this war, these wars, Vietnam, World War II, whatever war you want, they come home having experienced it. It's very much part of their, of, 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 of their DNA, their, their hearts and their souls and their brains, and, and they do okay. And there's a certain subset that has a more difficult time. And... Uh, and from there, it really comes down to the individual guy. I'm kind of rushing the answer because I think I'm done. But look, before you go, before you go, I, this is it's a beautiful day. This is a little sobering, what I've talked about. Uh, but I really, uh, uh, I'm glad you came. So thank you very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.